So good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first Friday hacks of the semester. So for today's session, we are inviting Herbert to give a talk. So Herbert, he, he graduated from NUS in 2020. And when he was in NUS, he worked in multiple companies as interns. And let's welcome him to the stage. Thank you. Uh, so hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. So the reason why I ask those questions is because then if you are year one and or you are, you know, just started learning programming, that's great because this talk is exactly for you. <clears throat> but maybe I start by introducing my, myself first. So who am I, right? So I graduated NUS year 2020. So I started uh, 2015, basically. And like, yeah, yesterday, like not yesterday, last week there was hack and roll, right? And like, uh, I kind of like just wandered around in the hall and like looked at the projects that people made. So like, it, there might be a chance that you might have seen me. But yeah, some people ask me, oh, what year am I? And I also don't really know how to answer. So I just answer like year eight because... That's kind of what I am doing right now, I suppose. And wait, this doesn't work. Okay, so I guess I just graduated and did nothing. Does this work? Come on. There you go. Okay, so yeah, I mean, uh, graduating from NUS 2020 is interesting because I graduated exactly during COVID. There was no graduation. There was no graduation trip. Uh, you know, they have a promised graduation, but they got delayed three times. In the end, they have like a very lame, you know, like uh, online graduation, which really means nothing. <clears throat> but yeah, I'm also a past NUS Hackers core team member, uh, which is, you know, like where the kind people have helped to organize this. And now currently I am at Allium. So Allium is a startup that does crypto data. Uh, so I don't know how much, how many people of you are interested in such things. So I won't elaborate so much about it. But if you are interested, feel free to talk to me later uh, during pizza or whatever. But yeah, uh, you know, enough about me. Most importantly, it's about you. So since a lot of you did year one, so it's likely that you finish your first semester. And first of all, I want to say congratulations. And the reason is because I actually think that <clears throat> programming isn't such a simple activity. Like, you know, like there's a lot of like, let's say, training programs, coding boot camps and whatnot that say, oh, you can learn programming in like six to eight weeks. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't think that, you know, you can really do that. Um, but yeah, <clears throat> uh, the fact that you managed to like finish a grilling semester in NUS somewhere, I think that's pretty great. Uh, but maybe the next question you have is like, now what, right? And so, you know, the reason why I give this talk is because I was in a similar position as you. I started learning programming in uni. And after I finished my first semester, I was like, okay, sure, I can do programming. But then why do I need to spend the next seven semesters in NUS doing stuff? So what can I do in my, you know, newly acquired skills? <laughs> and I since learned that, you know, the best way to do it is to scratch your itch. So what I mean by that, right, is that, you know, all of us have our personal things that we want to do, like personal problems and whatnot. And like, you know, there's quite a lot of like stuff that you can solve by programming. And you don't like, you know, as I said, solve your problems, but you don't have to cure cancer either. Like you don't need to like, you know, like think of the biggest next thing that can revolutionize the world or like whatever. You can just start by small things. So <clears throat> to start with, I'm going to like uh, tell you about a problem that I had in, let's say, 2020, because I wanted to buy a new number for various reasons. So what I did, right, was that back then, uh, so maybe until now, there was this thing called GOMO. So GOMO is like basically a mobile plan by, so it's like, you know, Singtel decided to like create this mobile plan and like market it to like, well, you guys basically, Gen Z, I guess. <laughs> and like, <laughs> so yeah, I wanted to buy a new number. And what I realized is that, okay, so let's say I wanted to buy now, right? And I realized that, oh, you know, I can select a number and then I can also get more numbers. And okay, so there's these 18 numbers, but like, sure, which one do I want, right? Because like, it's very likely that I'm going to use this number for a long years to come, right? Okay, so now let's say I'm being indecisive and I started to refresh this. I see a different set of numbers. And when I click show me more numbers, yeah, it's also a different set of numbers. So this made me really curious. 
okay, sure, there's a set of numbers, but maybe is it possible to get every number that is in the GOMO database? And maybe, you know, I can figure out what's the prettiest number so that I can, uh, you know, like use that and like tell to my friends about my cool number basically without, you know, like paying a lot of, uh, paying a lot of money. Like last time <laughs> I actually checked like carousel, they sell numbers like what, I don't know, eight 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 seven eight 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 or whatever and like they sell it for like thirty eight thousand or something and like you know i can just say to them oh you know i don't need to like spend five digit amount just to get a nice number okay so <laughs> fortunately i have no programming so uh we can figure out if this can be solved with programming so this is the browser right so i'm using firefox probably a lot of you are using chrome or safari maybe but so one thing that the browser is very useful for is this thing called inspect, which basically brings up the developer tool. And you can see that they have a lot of tools here. Well, I don't really want this. Mm, okay, maybe I just use the shortcut. Okay, where's the network tab? Okay, this doesn't go as well as I wanted. Okay. Well, there you go. Uh, so I think by right, there should be some tabs here, but I'm not sure why today there's no tabs here. But oh well. Okay, so let's say I refresh this, right? <laughs> so what's cool about this network tab, right? Okay, first of all, I'm just going to zoom this so that all of you can see it. Okay, not this one. Well, not this one either. Okay, the calf sucks. <laughs> okay, there you go. Zoom out. There you go. Okay, uh, I, get, I hope all of you can see this. Is it too small? Okay, it looks like it's okay. So, so I realized that, okay, there's like quite a bit of like network calls being made here. So why is this tab after all, right? So what this tab does is that it shows, okay, when you open a, uh, let's say a website, what kind of like network calls do my browser make in order to like get all of this? And you can see here some of the stuff. For example, uh, the first one, the type is HTML, which basically is just a document itself. And then there are some JavaScript files, which are the scripts and some PNG files, you know, to show this uh, blob. I guess, and you know, <clears throat> and a bunch of other stuff. But one thing that strikes me is this thing called the JSON. So what's a JSON, right? So you can think of a JSON as a CSV. It's like a data format that is useful uh, to, to, let's say, transmit things that are compact. That's a big oversimplification, but you can think about it that way. And you can see, okay, when I click here, I can see the headers, I can see the cookies, I can see the request, response, and whatnot. So a lot of this might make zero sense to you. Uh, and I think that's perfectly fine. Uh, <clears throat> because the point is that the more you get familiarized with these kind of things and the more you tinker with things, the more you understand stuff. But like, I'm just going to kind of tell you stuff so that you know. So you can see in the response. Okay, so what does this do, right? So I make a call, uh, my browser rather makes a call into like some JSON and like it returns a JSON output. And you can see here, okay, so this looks very promising because there's pageable, sort, and content. So what happens if I click content, right? And here you can see that these are the numbers that are being shown. So this is 82856484, which is this one. And then you have 8264, 8262-4946, which is this one, and so on and so forth. Okay, I was like, well, you know, now I can see the API call that is being made. So what I can even do is that I can right click this and copy URL and I can open it in a new tab. And now I can see all the data being listed here. And I was like, well, that's pretty neat. <clears throat> and what else did I notice? So if you look at the URL, the URL says, you know, API hybrid V1 numbers 34. But the number 34 kind of strikes me as <clears throat> interesting, let's say, because well, what does the number 34 mean, right? So what happens if I change it to another number? 
like let's say 33. And then you can see that it's an entirely different set of numbers. So it turns out what happens is that when I refresh this, I can see, okay, now it's querying 55. Another thing, okay, it's querying 45 and so on. Okay, so this is cool. So now how can we, you know, like get all the numbers and so that I can filter it according to like, or I sort it according to the numbers that I find pretty, right? So this is where programming comes to the rescue. So uh, today I'm just going to use Python because, well, uh, I happen to be uh, most familiar with Python right now, but obviously everyone has different programming languages and preferences, but the point is that uh, they are all pretty similar. And I'm also like, uh, you know, kind of old, so I'm using Vim as well. Now you might use a different text editor, but you know, like the point isn't really the text editor or the language, the point is really what you can do with programming. So first of all, let's make a uh, call it fire hex just so that I can, you know, put everything inside here. So let's call this como.py. Okay, so now I have a blank Python file. So first of all, we need to figure out, okay, how do I make requests to this, right? So fortunately, there's this cool thing called Google. So I'm just going to Google that. Uh, hey, uh, Devansh, do you have like a uh, clip, my clip? Yeah. Okay, while well, we wait for him. Um, so what's the obvious way to Google it? Python, how to, uh, I don't know, connect to internet, let's say. And then you can see the stuff here. Okay, there's some links over here and whatnot. Okay, this one looks interesting. So let's open this. And now you can see, okay, this is how you connect to internet. Okay, open a connection to a URL using URLib and then you can print the result code. Okay. This looks promising. And then you can read the HTML file here. So why do we try that? So while we wait for the mic, I'm just going to one hand type for the moment. Yeah. So it says import your lib the request, right? And then no, no. I'm hoping that they have the code here. My but best. okay, here we go. Seven. How about this for the code above? Okay, so open a connection to our URL using URL. Let's try that. Web URL equals URL dot request dot get, I think, is it? No, dot URL open. <clears throat> okay, so what URL do you want to try, right? So why don't we try this one? Mm. Okay, and then what do we do next? We want to print the data here, right? So let's try that. Mm. Data equals web URL dot read. And now I can print the data. So let's try that and see what happens. Okay, sure. So we do python go more dot py. Now we can see, okay, that's promising because now we can get the data with, okay, that's helpful. Now we can get the data uh, of the website that we wanted to query. Okay, uh, can you figure this out? Oop. Okay. Mic pass. I guess I need, yeah, I need it higher. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, this is also helpful. Yeah, this. Is connected using this one. I think. Test, test. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, I hope the Zoom folks are okay. <laughs> well, anyway, so now we have the, the result of the first URL, right? Okay, but as I mentioned, what do we want to do? First of all, we want to like just extract the number because there's a lot of junk here that I don't really need. Like example, do I need a created date? The number, uh, well, I need the number, but I don't need the ID, I don't need the status and so on. So first of all, I need to collect it somewhere. 
and so, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the data format of this is using JSON. So how do I, uh, you know, extract the data from JSON, right? And this is where you can also Google Python uh, extract JSON, let's say. And they'll tell you stuff here, and you can click on one, and you can see, blah, 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 blah. You can, they have an import JSON. Okay, that's promising. And they have a JSON.dump and whatnot. So yeah, I mean, you know, <clears throat> there's a lot of stuff here, but I can just tell you that what you can do is that you can use json.loads basically. And, and what it does is like it converts a byte string or yeah, or rather a string in Python into a JSON, uh, uh, like say a Python dictionary or a Python object really. So what happens if you try this, right? Okay, well this is more promising because earlier, this <laughs> this really a string because there's a you know quote at the front and at the end, but now it's just the stuff. So now how do we store this data in, let's say a list. A list is really just an array, right? So you can have like phone numbers equals empty. And what we can do is that we can iterate through this data. First of all, we want to access the content. So let's try that. Mm, content equals data content. And we can iterate it because it is a list. So for number in content, what we want to do is that we want to populate this list with the data. So we don't want just a number, but we want to like access the number key. So we do that. And then we can try to print phone numbers again. Okay, that's not good. And reason why is because you realize I, I removed the json.loads. So we need to add like json data equals json.loads data. And then I can do something like this again. And now I can see all the numbers in a list. Okay, so this uh, first step, but a very major step regardless. And all is good so far. So now, as I mentioned, what do you want to do, right? Uh, I thought I thought about how this link, the ending number is really like, you know, uh, gotta be different for all the numbers from one to 100, right, for example. So the easiest way to do this is right, okay, so why don't we just iterate through all the URLs and then we can collect them into the list. So let's try that. And we can just, you know, use this thing called range. We can start from one and at, at end at 99. And the reason why I'm putting 100 is because the end list in Python, the end range in Python is exclusive. So I'm doing this. And now we can change this to be something like plus, uh, we need to convert the string first. Okay, so what happens if we try this? Then, and we can also print i because why not? And you can see, okay, it's hitting a bunch of APIs and it's getting a lot of phone numbers. And all of them looks different. And see, okay, so what's the next step? Well, the easiest step is that we can just collect them, all of them, into this phone numbers list. And then we can just put a pen here and we can just say, you know, uh, fetching plus string i. And then we can print, you know, let's say we just print the length of the phone numbers. And how many do we get? Well, let's wait for this. And I also do hope that they are not really limiting us. <laughs> Doesn't look like so. And you can see that at the end, we get 1,782 phone numbers. Okay, so that's good and all. We have 1,700 NP. But then the next step is then, <clears throat> How do we know which one is the, you know, the nicest, let's say. How do we know which one is the best phone number? I'm going to close this. <laughs> and for that, we need to basically somehow sort the phone number list. So we need to figure out a way such that we can sort the phone number list. And so that means we need to think of a heuristic in which we can say, okay, what phone number is beautiful, right? And probably one of the easiest way to do that is to just print uh, to just sort based on the number of distinct digits in the phone number. Because then you can say, okay, hey, maybe 988-988-98 is very, very nice because there's only two distinct digits. 
but maybe something like I don't know nine two four seven one three six eight is maybe not so nice because he has eight distinct digits and people will have a hard time remembering it. Okay, so now we know that how this phone number. Fortunately, uh, you know Python being Python, it has the sorted function, and you can pass in the phone numbers and it'll sort the phone numbers list for you. But you might realize that if we just do this, it'll just sort it in alphabetical order, which just means like, you know, for example, it starts from like 8111111, all the way to eight nines, for example. But that's not really want, what we wanted to do. But then, so the sorted function has this, uh, let's say parameter called key, and we can pass in a function that takes in a phone number and returns whatever you want, and it can be used as the key. So what do you want from this, right? Now we define a, a function. Let's call this function uh, get what? Get unique numbers in string. And, and we can get the string here. So what should we put inside here? <laughs> so the easiest way to do this, well, first of all, we need to know the number of unique uh, characters inside a string, right? That's what we wanted to do. And fortunately, we can also Google this again. Number of Python get unique number of characters in a string. Oh, that's convenient. We can probably just use this. Okay, so it says, use the set class to convert the string into a set of unique numbers, unique characters rather. And that's pretty convenient. We can use the set function. We can just pass in a string and we can already get a set of stuff. So, okay, why don't we just try it just to make sure that we get this right. Okay, set A, A, B, C, for example. Okay, we get a set of three elements. And what happens if I just keep on spamming A, B, C, A, B, C, right? We still get a set of three characters. So that's pretty convenient. Now that we have a set, we can just pass this to the length function, which means we can just return the length of the set of the string. And now, if we try that, okay, first of all, we need to change this key. Mm, okay, maybe for easier display, we can just write sorted phone numbers equals mm, sorted phone numbers key equals get unique numbers in string. And then <laughs> we can just iterate through this sorted phone numbers for number in sorted phone numbers. We can just print the number. And then we can pass it this again to the get unique numbers in string so that we know, okay, how many unique characters are there? And now when you try this, okay, first of all, it fetches all the phone numbers again, right? And like, well, this is kind of lame. And of course, if you want to be like very try hard about it, you can put it in some cache or some file or whatever. But anyway, this is just for a, a quick tinkering. And now we can see, okay, this looks great. Because now we can see all the phone numbers as well as the number of unique digits. Sample 96218204 has seven digits. Okay, that's correct. And there's a lot of seven, and there's a lot of six, and there's a lot of five. Okay, uh, I don't want to show all this. Now we can see, and there's a bunch of four. And these are probably the ones that we want to look at. <coughs> now, of course, what I'm giving you is really just one simple example of like how you can get a, you know, how you can have a heuristic to get a nice phone number. And of course, you don't really need to follow this. But, you know, like this serves as a good start. And maybe from here, you can choose a good number. For example, here I notice 8438, 5438. That looks pretty good to me. And, <coughs> okay, sure. Now we have the phone number. But how do we actually buy this phone number, right? How do we actually use it? Well, uh, Remember how we need to like choose number from here, right? Not this one, this one. We need to choose a phone number from here, but this phone number list is only displayed from the API call being made here, which means we actually need to tag each phone number with the API call so that we can know which API uh, we should watch out for. For example, this 9709074 here is tagged to the API number 45. And we need to know, okay, for our pretty number, what API call should it be tagged to? And fortunately, this again can be solved with some programming. Because then, instead of like just putting the phone numbers, 
we can also just create a tuple that contains the API call as well, which is this I over here. And then when we sort it, we can print, you know, uh, the number here. And like, remember how phone numbers, phone numbers now contains a list of a tuple. What's a tuple? The tuple is the phone number and the index of the API call. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> so now that we have this, now we can just print the number straight away and there should be no more code changes needed. And we will try this and we need to wait for a bit again. But unfortunately it's just 10 seconds at most. We can see that, okay, now we can see all the API calls being made. Although there's a problem here. What's the problem here is that now the length counts the length of the tuple instead of just the length of string, which is why when you see all the prints here, everything is two. Well, because the length of the tuple is two, right? So we need to modify this such that now this really means string pair and we get the first element of the string pair. And when we try this again, I hope everything is good. <clears throat> now we can see, okay, 9617.5034 has eight different characters and so on. Which means if we scroll through all this junk, we can see all the four distinct digits again, and we can choose which one do you want. Like, what do we talk about just now? I don't remember already. Yeah, let's choose Fiverr. What, what number do you guys like? Okay, some people are pointing, but I don't know what you're pointing to. So I'm just going to choose a number, a random one. I don't know, uh, 9390544959. Okay, that doesn't look very good. Okay, maybe, maybe this one, 8284 or whatever. Okay, now we know that the API call that we need to make is the API call 35. So how do we do this API call 35? So for this, what happens in the end that I did was I really just spam refresh until I see the number 35. Okay, it's 53, it's 59, it's 37, it's four, it's 24. So this can get kind of boring. So I'm, I'm just st gonna stop at one point. But what happens here is that, well, <clears throat> I mean, the possible value of the price is only 100 anyway at most, which means on average, we just need to refresh the 100 times, which, you know, I mean, you can like do this while eating dinner or like watching a movie, not really important. Uh, uh, well, there you go, 54, right? Isn't it? Oh, we don't want 54, we want 35. What am I talking about? Yeah, well, I'm just gonna stop somewhere. 29, okay, there's 29 here, right? So this 82850205, which honestly is pretty good too. And now, if we check here, well, there you go. We have the number right here. And now, this is exactly how I proceeded to buy my, let's say, semi-beautiful number uh, for free from Gomo. And now I can click next. And you know, obviously I'm not going to actually buy a new SIM card, but if you wanted to do something like this, you can. Okay. So that kind of like is about the buying the phone number. Now there's all of that. But what, we ha what have we learned today? <clears throat> so there are quite a few lessons that uh, maybe I just want to highlight. So first of all, uh, obviously, uh, you notice that I can complete this entire exercise in like, I don't know, 10, 20 minutes. And for you, if you have less experience in programming, it can take you much longer. And that is perfectly fine. Because the point is, uh, you know, mm, <laughs> like all, all the failures that you make and all the trials that you did uh, basically will enhance your experience and make you be a better programmer. And in the future, when you have this kind of itches that you want to scratch, you should be able to scratch them more easily. <clears throat> and you know, like this demo also skips all the grueling process it gets to get right. For example, you know, like resolving bugs, you know, like uh, handling stupid, I don't know, rate limiting errors or whatever that you might be able to face when you do stuff. But the other thing is, first of all, <clears throat> uh, browser dev tools. Uh, browser dev tools are very, very powerful. There's a lot of stuff inside browser dev tools that a lot of people use. And like even uh, me right now, which well, I mean, I'm literally a web dev professional because I'm doing web development in a corporate setting. And we still use these browser dev tools a lot. 
like this is basically our friend every day and <clears throat> you know like it'll do you good uh you know but if you can get familiar with this because there's actually a lot of very useful things inside here for example well this is not the browser well i'm not going to show it here i guess but like you can see that there's the inspector there's the console there's the network and there's even more tabs and as you develop more let's say web apps or like you know try to do this kind of like hacking you are, you'll be able to like see more stuff <clears throat> and the next thing that i want to highlight is about googling just now we googled python how to connect to internet so obviously as you get more experience uh, you should be able to like google uh, these simple queries less and less but the point is that even i also google problems and like open stack overflow every day like everyone does that so you don't need to be shy or shameful when doing this kind of stuff and you know in some sense this is also why uh programming is very nice right because there's a lot of like community there's a lot of like blog posts online stack overflow does a really great job in like doing stuff <coughs> and you know but also now you might not be even like doing googling anymore you can even just ask chat gpt now and like in fact in the example of chat gpt one of the examples is really literally how do i make an http request in javascript so if you're using javascript you might even just do this this reminds me when i was in hack and roll last week uh really a lot of like uh people are using chat gpt uh for their projects and i thought that's like very fascinating like shows how advanced ai can be these days okay <clears throat> so this is for the first demo that i'm doing so we have time right okay so the next one i want to show you is what i did last year which is a chess opening trainer so um, chess has been in the boom these days <clears throat> and i actually i got into chess like during 2020 because of the same reason as a lot of people positively which is number one i'm, I'm bored because of the lockdown number two there was queen's gambit so okay chess is interesting so what do i mean by this chess opening trainer right it's because so chess is uh for context right chess is uh, not a very easy game uh easy you know like you don't have like chess professionals playing all day right <laughs> so in chess in general there are like a few phases into uh, the game and the one that i want to highlight is the opening and what's the opening right the opening is literally just the first few moves that you make uh in order to like get a good position let's say so <clears throat> if you are a beginner well the first move that you might learn is like this thing called e4 e5 and then you move here and you move here for example and here and here and whatever basically just well what's the idea here you are just putting all of your let's say cavalry out and then you just want to like you know like continue the game let's see <clears throat> and here what i what i'm using here is this thing called lee chess so lee chess is basically just a chess server a place where you can play chess games but then it has a lot of extra features and this one of them which is the analysis board <laughs> and now you can see that there are several features here right so first of all i can make the moves and then at the top right there's this number so why is this number this number is what we call the evaluation <clears throat> so as some of you might have already known like chess engines have beaten humans for the past well since 2000 essentially and like this represents the evaluation that the chess engine gives according to this position so the more plus it is the better it is for white and the more minus it is the better it is for black so for example here let's say uh you know like black makes an absurd move for example here now you can see that it's like plus 2.3 and you know like that's basically significantly better for white already <coughs> so why am i showing you this right and the reason is because uh because i'm like very kiasu and i want to improve my chess <coughs> what happens is that i want to learn chess and i want to like learn certain openings better so what i mean by that is that i want to memorize the first few moves of the chess game so that when an opponent plays that i know how to react and i get prepared well before him and this is common for basically all levels of the game <clears throat> so for my level which you know i'm not very good uh you can try to memorize let's say you know up to 10 first moves uh, of like popular openings but if you see like for example like chess grandmasters like the world champion magnus carlsen 
Like they can even memorize up to like 25, 30, 35 moves. And they do a lot of stuff like this. <coughs> so what I wanted to do, right? Okay, sure, I can try to memorize it here and I can try to play it myself. But what if I want to actually like, you know, try to simulate it against an opponent and see, okay, what are the common first moves that opponent makes? And what are the common moves that opponent makes? Because, well, for example, here I'm playing this pawn here. Opener already has a lot of moves. He can move this pawn here, they can move this pawn here, and so on. They can move this knight, and so on. But it's not realistic for me to remember all of them. Because in reality, most of my opponents will probably play, first of all, this move, for example, which we call the open game. Or, for example, this one, which is the Sicilian defense. And there's like probably a bunch of other stuff that you know I just want to know, and that's all. <laughs> okay, so how do I do that, right? So fortunately, and the great thing is that Lichess.org is uh, open source and free software. What does it mean by that? <laughs> that means that first of all, uh, it is literally free and you can, okay, how do I do this? Lichess.org open source. You can literally see the source code. And here are all the source code that you can see. You know, this is the main server, and you can literally see the you know the code here. You can fork it, you can clone it, you can do whatever you want with it. And there's a bunch, uh, there's a bunch of stuff as well. <coughs> and the great thing, okay, this is the architecture and whatnot. And the cool thing about Liches is that it also exposes the API. <coughs> so here you can see that there's an API over here. So what what can we do with the API after all? <coughs> so for reference, what I normally used to do is that when I bring up the analysis board over here again, in here, there's the book icon, and I can see what people most commonly play. So for example, E4. So now you can see that this has been made like 526 times, this has been made 258 times, uh, 1,000 times, this has been made 137,000 times, and so on. Okay, so now I have this data, which means I know which are the most common moves that my opponents are going to make. <laughs> but how am I going to simulate this? For example, the total here is like 1 million, 1, 000, uh, 1 million, 100,000 positions and games. How do I uh, try to simulate it such that, okay, 46.3% uh, of the time, my opponent plays this. And then 22.7% of the time, my opponent plays this, and so on. And now we can check the API. So what is an API after all, right? So API stands for Application Programming Interface, which really just means an easier way if you want to access a certain service, let's say. And this is one of the service that I want to access. But I, you know, one thing that I can do is obviously I can just use the inspector and like try to scrape this. But this is a lot of pain, right? Because like you need to like actually read the stuff. But now if you have the API at the bottom, there's this thing called Opening Explorer. And this is exactly what I wanted. <laughs> so for example, if I open this link over here, now I can see all the data that I wanted in a nice JSON format. You can see, okay, so these are the moves that I make. And then now I can see, okay, so white, uh, you know, like white wins this number of times, there's this number of draws and black wins this number of times. And these are the moves that, you know, like uh, people suggested. Let's say the, the, the open air core suggested. Uh, yeah, okay, so this one of them move the piece on C6 to the piece on D5. So maybe just a bit of chest rotation. If you notice at the board, at the bottom there's A, B, C, D until H. And at the, at the rightmost column, there's one, two, three, four until eight. And this is how you identify squares. For example, this square over here is E4, because this is E, and this is 4, and so on. <clears throat> so let's go back to the thing just now. Okay, now I can see everything here. And there's also some top games. Okay, so there's a game between, you know, the past world champion, Fishy Anan, versus the current world champion, Magnus Carlsen, and whatnot. And there's a bunch of other games as well. Okay, sure. I don't really want to care about this. I just want to, uh, you know, let's say get the moves that I want. So now we go back to our terminal. 
let's call this chess.py. Okay, sure, now we can make API requests, <laughs> but is there a chess library, is there a chess application in Python that we can use to make our life easier? And the easiest way to do that is to just Google Python chess library. And we can see in the first spot, there's a Python chess library indeed. And this is very neat. Because now you can see, okay, you can literally just import chess and then you can make a bunch of stuff here. And it even has the installation process. So like, why don't we try this? So pip install chess. <coughs> okay, so now uh, it has installed the chess Python library. And now when we try to interact with this, import chess. So why don't we try solve these? Okay, so we can start with the board, chess.board, and we can see all the legal moves, board.legal moves. Okay, well, that's a bunch of stuff. Let's convert it to a list, and we can see all the, all the legal moves that uh, one can make from the starting position. And this is very convenient because then uh, we can hopefully use this library if this library has a lot of like comprehensive features and that hopefully can make our life simpler. Okay, so why don't we try that? We can import chess and at some point, we probably also want to import the, you know, the request from URL lib because we are probably going to make requests into the, um, into the libchess API. <coughs> so what do you want to do here, right? So, so let's say the simplest, right, is that we can just start from an empty board and then we can just pretend to be the first player in the game, which is white, and we can try to make moves and let the computer uh, hit the API and simulate a move from there. Okay, so why don't we try that? So we can see here, there's the query parameters and whatnot. There's the fan, there's the play, there's the scenes and whatnot. Okay, so the one that I'm just going to like highlight is the fan over here. So how do we do this, right? Is that first of all, we just copy this endpoint. Mm, request dot, okay, I, I don't remember already. Really the request dot URL open. Oops. URL open. Okay, so it needs a fan. So what is a fan, right? So a fan in chess, it's really a format, a representation of the chessboard. And you can, you can open chess.com here and you can see, okay, uh, there's a bunch of stuff here. Okay, this is a bit too technical, but the point is that, okay, let's say if we go here, you can see that there's the fan here. And if I make a move, the fan is going to change. And if I make another move, the fan changes again. And this is the fan that I wanted. But okay, so how do we get this fan, right? And this where, fortunately, if we do like board.fan, okay, we need to call it. Well, there you go, the fan. And this is the power of the Python chess library, essentially. So now we can start from an empty board and we can try to make a URL request and we put the fan in here. And we can just try to print data.grid, I believe, right? Data.grid. So let's try that and see what happens. <coughs> well, there's stuff happening here. Oh, I know what happened. Uh, it's because this thing is called chess.py. Let's, okay. let's change the name from chess.py into why the heck chess.py. And we can try that again. And you can see URL can contain control characters. So what happens here is that we need to like basically encode this URL so that it contains characters that the URL can recognize. Because here you can see that <coughs> uh, like the URL here has slashes and whatnot, but this is not exactly what we want to uh, send to the, let's say the URL. You want to encode the URL and we can search, okay, how do we Python URL encode? And here you can see, okay, there's URL lib dot parse. So we can try that.
dot parse dot code plus. And now we can see the data. And if we go through the same process of like using JSON to basically convert this, uh, JSON dot dumps. Okay, so here there's a, oh, we need to use JSON dot loads. And here we can see all the data in a dictionary again. <coughs> so yeah, basically from here, uh, you can continue uh, doing, let's say the JSON decoding and whatnot. And like, then you can like do a cool stuff, do a lot of cool stuff with the chess library really. For example, uh, I think let's say board equals chess dot board. And when we print board, we can see that there's actually like, you know, an SC representation of the chessboard. And we can, when we make moves, move, no, make. Okay, let's see how do we make moves with the Python chess library. Uh, there's a push sun, okay. Dot push sun E4, for example. And now we can see the board has changed and whatnot. So this can be useful to basically create uh, the board as we wanted to see it. <laughs> so I'm not going to really bore you the, with the details of like how to actually use this, but you can imagine that the idea is, uh, we can just print the board and the Python script can accept an input. And when it accepts an input, it can make the move and then it can request the URL so that it can you know basically get a set of responses. And then we can use the random number generator to pick a random move that corresponds to the number of games played in that branch. And then you can return the prompt to us and we can do this indefinitely basically. <clears throat> and so that's what I kind of did, let's say uh, one year ago. And in the end, because the Python script is also kind of lame, I also like, just converted it into a, a, a web app basically, where you can actually use a front end and manipulate it with stuff. So here you can see exactly the same thing. Okay, for example, I make this move. Oh, the open can make the same move. Okay, uh, this has occurred in this number of positions and the probability is 31%. And now I can make this move, for example, and I make this move and whatever and so on. I mean, I'm, just, I'm not just going to bother you with all of this. Yeah, it is here or whatever. Well, but the point is, <laughs> Uh, you know, like you can see how programming can uh, help me, in this case, get better at chess. I hope, even though I still suck. But okay, so this is like definitely more complicated than the phone number example. But I think the most important, uh, let's say, lesson that uh, we can learn from this example is that <coughs> uh, I want to highlight the power of open source because here, we use, a, we use a bunch of open source libraries. For example, the Opening Explorer by Lee Chess or the Python Chess library that we can use so that we can do whatever we want. And uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of projects that has a lot of open source data and that can be a very useful thing uh, you know, when you actually start building your projects. And the hope is that in the future, maybe once you actually do something uh, that is great. You can open source stuff so that people can use your project too. And we can build on top of each other and basically, you know, stand on the shoulders of the co collective giant, let's say. So in fact, like the website I showed you earlier is also open source in my GitHub. And if you want to somehow use it, it's here. It's here. <coughs> yeah, so you know, like if you're actually good with React and whatnot, Maybe you want to submit a pull request, feel free to do so. Okay, so now I have shown you uh, two examples where I actually use programming in my real life to scratch your itch, to scratch my itch. So now what, right? Now that I've shown you two examples, what can you do? Of course, what you can do is you can scratch your itch. This is my problems. Uh, this is the, you know, the things that I want to get better at and whatnot. But you have a different set of problems, you have a different set of things that you might want to work on, and maybe you can think of like using programming in order to basically improve your life. And, you know, one of the early examples is like 
<coughs> so all of you might have known, obviously all of you know NUS Mods now, but NUS Mods was really a personal project as well by one of our seniors. And it was developed, let's say, I don't know, 12 years ago or something like that during like 2011, 2012, like no NUS Mods. The way for you to arrange NUS modules suck a lot. So this senior had the idea, okay, so you know, I want to select my modules. How do I do that? And this is where NES Mods V1 is born. And you can see it at the right here. Even it's just says like module finder and like NES Mods beta and whatnot. Now, obviously, now the NES Mods that you see is different from the NES Mods 10 years ago. They have a core team, they are official, they are you know working officially with NUS uh, or rather in a partnership, and they have a lot of like very cool features in order to, you know, like basically make your life better during planning modules. But the point is that NES Mods was also created to scratch someone's itch. And again, I'm not saying you need to cure cancer. And like NES Mods as of now is like really big, but yes, humble beginnings. And maybe if you have a small project as well, and like if it gathers steam, now a lot of people can contribute to it and it can become big as well. And instead of just scratching your itch, it can also scratch other people's itch. <clears throat> okay, so now I have talked about all of this, but maybe you are thinking, okay, I don't know where to start. Uh, sure, I have problems, but my problems seem to be, to be big. Uh, how do I gain the necessary experience and knowledge so that I can try a step at it? And this is where I think learning more is important. <laughs> because then, as you learn more, you can start to build uh, a bunch of like, you know, other media, other things that you can use. The one that I showed you are all using Python. But maybe you want to build a web app. Maybe you want to build a Telegram bot. Maybe you want to build a mobile app. And this is where, uh, Fortunately, there's a lot of like resources that you can use online in order to in order to understand this stuff better. So, for example, earlier I described you know ways where, for example, you can Google how to connect to the internet with Python. You can even like you know just browse very free tutorials on the internet. As far as I remember, Microsoft recently released a you know Microsoft Mozilla. I don't remember. Like released a full on dev tutorial from start to finish and. You know, those kind of things is always very useful. But of course, uh, I'm also going to plug my NUS Hackers organization, even though I have graduated. So first of all, we have this thing called Hacker School. I don't actually know when's the next Hacker School, so you can ask the NUS Hackers core team members. And we also have Hacker Tools. <laughs> and what are these? So these are, you know, basically ways, uh, let's say workshops, where uh, NUS Hackers like give so that, you know, you can become better at hacking, become better at programming in general. And as I remember, uh, the first Hacker Tools workshop is going to be about Vim. And yeah, if you want to like um, know more about these kind of workshops, uh, feel free to like you know subscribe to our Telegram and whatnot. And lastly, I also suggest to join a community because <clears throat> I think a community is very valuable uh, because it allows you to like ask a lot of questions that might be unstructured and like you know like not really well you know, define in a Google search. Just now I searched how to Google, like how to search like, you know, like Python, how to connect to the internet. But maybe you don't really know to start. For example, I want to start building an app for my iPhone, but how do we do that? <laughs> and this maybe uh, having other people in your community can help you uh, guide you to the right direction and bring you to the right resources as you navigate this. And again, I'm just going to plug NUS Hackers. We have, a co we have a community of like different groups. We have a Telegram group, we have a Discord group, we have Fiverr, and you know, and like in case you find, let's say the stuff that NUS Hackers provides uh, to be inadequate or like somehow, uh, you know, like not a good fit for you. And I think that is perfectly fine because uh, <laughs> I think everyone has like different preferences. And you know, like feel free to like, you know, uh, find your own community, start your own community, and like, you know, learn together, basically. And yeah, uh, that's really all from me. So thank you very much. And I think pizzas are here too. So that's a good time. Okay, thanks Herbert for this talk. So now we are going to have a Q&A session. So if any of you have any question, please raise your hand and we'll pass you the mic. 
because I still need to wear this. So anyone? Before you leave, uh, a big shout out to our sponsor, Jane Street, who is sponsoring all the uh, our food. And also, uh, please, uh, we appreciate your feedback. So please scan the QR and um, from feedback, we will be able to improve more on organizing Friday hacks. And Okay, please take your time to scan. And of course, uh, as mentioned by Herbert just now, um, we are having a hacker tools um, session on next week and it's about Vim. So if you are interested, please feel free to sign up. And also, we are also uh, currently having a recruitment cycle and we'll be sending all the recruitment info on our hackers Telegram channel. So if you have not subscribed yet, please do subscribe. And here are the QR codes for our Telegram channels. Okay, and um, on a side note, for next week's Friday Hacks, we are inviting Dexter, who is an incoming NUSCS freshman who, who has done some indie development and he created this very cool app called Home Row and, and actually earned some money on it. So it's very interesting and very intriguing to hear about his experience on how to turn his idea into revenue. And also on the second session, we are, also, we are inviting some, some of the coolest hacks from the top eight of this year's Hack and Roll. So that's all for today. Um, have a great rest of your evening. Thanks.